Amen. We are studying our New Testament theology and dealing tonight with the new heading, although it might be well to sum up what we were talking about last time concerning the nature of the kingdom as a mystery and the conditions for entering the kingdom. We concluded that, but if you have all of the material either in notes or in your mind, then we covered as to the mystery of the kingdom, its nature, its laws of growth, all of these are mysteries. Its expansion, its present citizenship, and the mystery is that includes both the lost and the saved, which is a strange statement unless you know that that's one of the mysteries Jesus clearly teaches in the parables that it contains wheat and tares at the present time, the kingdom of God. The mystery of its present reality and manifestation, it's invisible at present. That's why the world doesn't know it exists. Israel's waiting for the kingdom, that is, that aspect of Israel that believes anything in the Old Testament, which, of course, they're in a the minority. And then it's a mystery concerning its value, the parable of the pearl. Its value is hidden to those who are unwilling to forsake all to obtain it. The value is hidden from them, and it's a mystery even as to its reception its conditions, because as we said last time, most people equate being in the church with being in the kingdom. And the mystery is you can join a church and still not be born again into the kingdom of God. So even the conditions for entering are a mystery. Tonight we come to the next point on your outline, if you have it. That is the relation of the kingdom to the church, a very important aspect of our study. In studying these things, as we've said about other things, it's not some academic exercise we go through here because if we were just going to do that, why we could establish a school and give diplomas and you could wear a cap and gown and really feel proud of yourself. <laughs> Hang your paper on the wall and forget it like most do. So it isn't that, but by your understanding the relationship and the nature of the kingdom, like its mystery and all, then you ensure that you get in it, as well as help others to find the way into the kingdom, because there are keys into the kingdom, and knowledge of the Word of God is one of the keys. The relation between the kingdom and the church. Now, is the kingdom of God and the church to be equated, equated as Augustine did? You've studied about him in this church years ago, church history, as Augustine did and the later Roman Catholic Church did. And if not, what is the relationship? Are they to be equated, church and kingdom? Now, it's surprising how many do equate the two. That is, if you're in the church, you're in the kingdom. And if you're in the kingdom, you're automatically a member of that so-called invisible mystical body of Christ somewhere that people keep talking about, but I haven't found it yet. The only body of Christ that's in the Bible is one like this, where you can see it, you can find the people. Amen. Well, anyway, we'll get to that later. So I want to deal tonight with scriptural evidences that show the church is not to be equated with the kingdom. This is seen, first of all, because the New Testament distinguishes between the church and the kingdom. The New Testament itself distinguishes between the church and kingdom. Jesus and the apostles preached the kingdom of God. And if it wouldn't be misunderstood, I would say, and not the church. But since people sometimes quote what they want you to have said instead of what you meant by what you said, then I'll say Jesus and the apostles, as well as the early church itself, preached the kingdom of God, not merely the church. So not merely is for the benefit of people who might stumble. But they didn't preach the church in the Gospels, they preached the kingdom. It's like the ratio of 121 to 2. <laughs> you kind of get the idea that the kingdom is what Jesus came to establish. Now, he came to establish his church. Don't minimize it. Get the tapes where we deal with the doctrine of the church. 
He died for his church. His church is a glorious thing to him. But you can't confuse the two is what we're saying. And the bigger concept is the kingdom of God and the church is within it, as we'll see. A ratio of 121 to 2. Now there are people sitting here tonight that don't know that the church is mentioned only two times in the four Gospels and the kingdom 121 times. Count them yourself. Now it isn't the church isn't important, but he didn't come to preach church. He came to preach the kingdom and the people who believe the message of the kingdom become the church. The church is not a building, it's the people in the kingdom. But they're in the kingdom. The church is in the kingdom. It's not the other way around. There are only two passages, and for those of you who wouldn't hear what we'd say for the next 20 minutes, I'll tell you what they are. <laughs> Upon this rock I'll build my church, Matthew 16. That's one place he said it, Matthew 16. Then the other place is Matthew 18, where he said, If they neglect to hear you, if you've gone to your brother who's sinned against you, and you take somebody else and he won't hear them either, then tell it to the church. Two places in the Gospel of Matthew. And as we've already shown you again and again, but we showed you, I guess it was last week, go to the book of Acts. They've got the message. They've got the Gospel. What does the book of Acts see them doing? From chapter 1 all the way through chapter 28, they're preaching the message of the kingdom, not the church. When people believe the message of the kingdom, they are the church. You don't have to go and say, well, now God wants to establish a church here. And then you start building a building or you contribute and put a roof on a building. They'll put up the four walls, somebody says. If you uh, contribute $1,000, we'll put your name over the church. That isn't the church. That's a building. If they would just say that, the church needs a place to meet. Will you contribute to that? Well, that would make sense in light of what the Bible teaches. And so it'd be silly to come and preach church when he's not going to build a building. He came to preach the kingdom, and everyone who receives the message of the kingdom becomes the church. Because the church is an ecclesia. The word ecclesia means the called out ones. It doesn't mean a building. In fact, the Bible never once uses the term church. That's a German word means a building. But what Jesus used, he said, upon this rock I'll establish my body of believers. That's what he said. He didn't say he was going to build a church building. But he's preaching the message of the kingdom. I feel like I'm laboring this point for the benefit of some that are new in the faith, are new in faith assembly, are visiting or whatever, and I don't mean any reflection on visitors, but do yourself a favor and get our theological tapes on the doctrine of the church. We're stating things here that we've already shown this church from the Word of God. So I'm not going to labor it. I'm just going to state it, and we'll have some proof texts along. But it's a long, detailed study, the church. Mark 1, 14 and 15, after John was put in prison, Jesus came preaching, I'm going to establish my church. He didn't say that. Mark says he came preaching the kingdom of God. In Matthew 3, when John the Baptist came, he came preaching the kingdom of God. When Jesus sent the apostles forth, every time he said, go preach the kingdom of God. When Jesus was raised from the dead in Acts 1, we're told for 40 days, he taught the apostles concerning the kingdom of God. All through the book of Acts. And when Paul, in chapter 28, is imprisoned, we're told that there he taught the Jews concerning the kingdom of God. So that's what he's preaching, the kingdom and he said, the time is fulfilled and the kingdom of God is at hand. Repent ye and believe the gospel. <laughs> the gospel is the message of the kingdom. But we've already proven all this, shown it again and again from Scripture, that the gospel is the gospel of the kingdom. It's not the gospel of this or that or denominations or creeds or your beliefs. It's the message of the kingdom, which is the whole Bible. Genesis to Revelation. Now that's the first thing. It's what they preached. We said that the New Testament distinguishes between the church and the kingdom because those who believe the message of the kingdom become the church. Now, since the church in the New Testament is not an organization, you never see that. You have to get into Catholicism and Protestantism to find an organization, an institution, with hospitals and old folks' homes and mission boards and you name it. The church in the New Testament is not an organization but an organism, you know, like 
Your body is an organism. Some of us are hands, feet, eyes, and so forth. So since the church in the New Testament is not an organization but an organism, nowhere does the New Testament do like some erroneously do, ever equate believers with the kingdom. Believers are equated with the church. Believers are never equated with the kingdom because this would be to confuse terminology. What is the kingdom? It's the reign and rule of God in the hearts of men. Right now, invisible. Later it will be made visible. But the kingdom is the reign and rule of God. So the church isn't the kingdom. The kingdom is the rule of God, and the church are those who are ruled over by God. The church consists of the citizens of the kingdom of God. And that's why the New Testament never equates kingdom with the church. You preach the kingdom, that creates a community of believers, which Jesus called his ecclesia. It'd be like if you went to England and heard someone say, we are the monarchy. But they would never say that because they are not the monarchy. They would say, we are the subjects of the monarchy, or the kingdom, same meaning. So don't confuse the subjects with the rule of God. We are the ruled, he is the ruler, he's the king, and you can't be a king without subjects. I mean, by analogy, you can't. So we become the ruled. Now keep in mind that there are those and large, vast portions of people who equate the two, but they certainly don't get it from the New Testament. Now, the identification of the church with the kingdom began with Augustine in the 4th century A.D. That's in the 300s, the 4th century A.D. And then the Roman Catholic Church, when it was established in about the 6th century, they say it goes back to Peter, but actually anyone who studied church history will get it about the 6th century. They pick up Augustine's theory that the church is to be equated with the kingdom. And that error, which it is, gave rise to another error, which we entitle the Universal Visible Church Theory of Rome. The Universal Visible Church Theory of Rome. Following Augustine, who equates the kingdom with the church, in other words, as extensive as the church is, so is the kingdom. As extensive as the kingdom is, so is the church, is what is implied there. So that gave rise when the Catholics picked it up to another error entitled Universal Visible Church Theory of Rome. Now Rome teaches on the basis of that theory that since the kingdom is universal, since the kingdom of God is universal, that is worldwide, it's not local like a church, you know, like this local church. Because, you see, a person can be a part of this body and a Christian can be a part of a body over in Australia. And we're both members of the kingdom, but we're not members of the same local body. And they're correct on that. The kingdom is universal. That's the first thing. And secondly, since there's no salvation outside the Roman Catholic Church, then quite logically the kingdom is to be identified with the universal, visible, Roman Catholic Church. If you admit one error, you can prove whatever you want about any subject. Rome accepts Augustine's view that the church and the kingdom are to be equated, and from that point they go on and try to prove other things. Their other premise is that you have to be in the Roman Catholic Church to be saved, and if the kingdom and the church are the same, then the Roman Catholic Church becomes the only doorway into the kingdom. You've got to be in their church to be in the kingdom. Now, don't you let any of these smooth-talking, and some of them are sincere, smooth-talking Catholics who claim to have the baptism, get your eyes off the fact that if you want to find out what Rome teaches, you've got to go to Rome, not to some nun with the baptism or some priest that says he's talking in tongues. Now, I'm not saying that some Catholics don't have the baptism. That isn't what I'm saying. But see, they're in the realm of emotion, a lot of them. Just like when we get the baptism, we're in the realm of emotion. That isn't bad. That isn't what I'm saying. But you can overlook a Methodist 
sprinkling and a Baptist whatever it is that you don't like about his teaching or Presbyterians this or that and the other, when you all get the baptism together, you start hugging and kissing. At least hugging. <laughs> and what I'm saying is you don't want to equate fellowship with truth. What the Pope now is doing traveling all over the world, of course, I don't want to digress on that, but the millions who just are practically, if not actually bowing down before him. We've even got our president that goes and pays homage to him and so forth. Unthinkable thing for Baptists to do even, oh, well, say 30, 40 years ago. <laughs> they write books about the difference between Baptists and Catholics. I've got one in my library, the differences between Baptists and Roman Catholics. That's where I picked up a lot of these things that they teach, not what they say always, but what they teach. So if you want to know what they believe, to this hour, Rome does not believe that there can be anyone saved outside their church. That's why he's traveling the world trying to get the church back to Rome. And the English, the Anglicans, and Episcopalians are just about ready to do it. I mean, they're laboring World Council of Churches, National Council. They're working night and day to get the churches back into Rome. They think that would be a good thing. So don't you let anyone delude you, especially the devil, that Rome still does not believe that you can be saved outside being baptized into their church. And so the kingdom is to be identified with the Roman Catholic, universal Roman Catholic, visible church, the visible church on earth. Now the Protestant reformers that came out of Rome, you see the reformers, Calvin the father of Presbyterianism, Luther, a priest in the Roman Catholic Church, Wesley, who came out of Anglican Church, which is just another name for Catholic. The only difference between Anglican and Roman Catholic is one's English and one's Roman. No other difference. The priest, the mass, everything's the same. Henry VIII just said, I'm the head of the church, not some pope down in Rome. And pope's just a man anyway, so that's why they're so close together and about ready to unite again. But anyway, the Protestant reformers who came out of Rome had a problem. Because you see, when they gave up Roman Catholicism, they were no longer in the universal Roman Catholic Church, which was the doorway into the kingdom, since they equate the Roman Church with the kingdom of God. And so quite logically, they had to invent their own kingdom church theory, which they did. And it is entitled the universal invisible church theory. The universal invisible church theory. The other was the universal visible church theory of Rome. See, Rome, it's a universal visible church theory. The visible Catholic church is the kingdom of God on earth, is what they teach. So the reformers, since they're no longer in the Roman church, that means they're not in the kingdom. They either had to go back to Rome or invent a new theory, which they did, which is a universal invisible church theory, that the true church is invisible. It's not that visible Catholic church. You can be a member of the church, that invisible, mystical church. And Luther and his followers invented this theory. It's not in the Bible, and yet to this hour, it's the basic Protestant position. And yet you won't find a word of it in the Bible. So the reformers reason this way. That since the kingdom is universal, spiritual, and invisible, at least in its present aspect, kingdom of God is within you, remember Jesus said, since the kingdom of God is universal, spiritual, and invisible, and since the church itself is visible, they couldn't deny that. In its local expression, it's visible. Then they said it is reasonable to deduce. <laughs> oh, that's where you get in trouble, friends. Just go to the seminary, and they give you all these reasonable deductions why the first 11 chapters couldn't be historical. They're legends. They're fairy stories. But anyway, back to what we were saying. Since the kingdom is universal and invisible, since the church is visible, then it's reasonable to deduce that there must be side by side with the local visible churches a universal church which is spiritual and invisible, which they term the mystical body of Christ. Again, you'll search all through the word for that terminology. 
So it was reasonable for them to deduce, since they had to, or either go back to Rome, that side by side with the local visible churches, they couldn't deny the church is visible, and Rome already had the theory for that. We are the universal visible church. And you've got to be in our church to be in the kingdom. They came out of their church, so they said side by side with local visible churches, there is an invisible, spiritual, mystical, universal body of Christ. And you ask them where it is. They don't know, but it's there. So what you've got, you've got Christians under Protestantism belonging to two churches. I don't know how in the world you can be a member of a local visible church and a member of another church off somewhere, some idealistic, mystical, vague, invisible, spiritual something, which has no existence outside the imagination of the Reformers. The Reformers made a lot of mistakes, friends. I certainly believe God was in the Reformation. He's not responsible for some conclusions some people come to. And that's not the only place that Luther missed it. If you got any Lutherans or former Lutherans, did you know your founder said that he didn't think the book of James was inspired? He called it a stroy little epistle. I don't know why the mighty Luther couldn't read it and see what James said. You don't follow men, you're supposed to follow the Bible. I'll stay with James. I think I will. Believe I will. Sure I will. I think Luther's with James too right now. I mean, I think he's agreeing with James. He's glad to agree with what James wrote. <laughs> he knows now that James is inspired, the book of James. Well, anyway, the Protestants teach. To this hour they teach it. And when I taught in the seminary up here, I suggested that we come to the biblical view on the doctrine of the church. Oh. Go back to your teaching functions, Old Testament theology and Hebrew and ethics. Leave the doctrine of the church. It's in the creed, you see. They'd have to change the whole creed, the whole denomination. <laughs> and they can't find one verse in the Bible to support the mystical body of Christ theory. As I say, all of that's on tape, so we're not trying to rehash that. But their answer to the Roman Catholic universal visible church theory is that the kingdom is invisible and spiritual. And the true church to which all believers belong, both living and dead, they say, not just living people, both living and dead, the true church is really invisible. And that's how they got around Rome. Because all believers, living and dead, of all ages past and all in the future, belong to that invisible, spiritual, mystical body of Christ. They take a metaphor out of the New Testament, which is a metaphor, and make a literal reality out of it. So Protestants taught that side by side with local visible churches, there's an invisible spiritual body of Christ off somewhere, the true church made up of all believers living and dead. Now, if you can tell me how you can belong to two churches at the same time. In fact, anyone who studied any philosophy, and I don't recommend you do, but if you have, you'll recognize just another case where the church allowed to enter its theology some Platonic idealism. Now, idealism, just to sum it up in a sentence, means that the world we see, the world and all the created objects, are not real, not the real thing. Behind this, there's an invisible spiritual idea, and that's the reality that we're only seeing the shadows, and the real is off in space, you know, the spiritual, what you might call heaven. That the idea is with the gods, as Plato would say, the idea of a world, the idea of a tree, or a stream, or a rock, or you. But we're just shadows of the reality. So you see how that Platonism has come in, and these men, the reformers, were students of philosophy too, you better believe it. Catholics are required to study it, and all of them came out of Catholicism. In fact, I was required to study it. That's how I know about it, but I didn't imbibe it. And that's not the only place Platonism affected New Testament theology, for those of you who are interested. The idea of man. It came right into the church. They've got him all divided up. The Greek idea, which is pagan philosophy again, is the body is a prison house which houses the soul, and the soul's trying to escape and get back to God. Of course, Plato would say the gods. 
That's right in the church to this hour. It's taught in the seminaries. And what does the Bible say? Man has a soul, says man is a soul. You are what God saves. All of you, even the body is redeemed and will be changed. And so, so many places idealism comes in. Now, we could digress and get off into Hebrews 9 and 10 and all of that, but unless somebody's got a question about it, I don't think we need to digress. A lot of people, and that's no criticism of you, don't even know what you mean by Platonic idealism to begin with. So what do you gain by just spending an hour talking about it? <laughs> but an ideal, see, the ideal thing is what's real and the earth and all isn't real. I should at least give the footnote that in Hebrews 9, and see, unless you're grounded in the word and philosophy, you can easily be led astray by some of these men. Remember Paul there speaks of the temple, the tabernacle, the altar, priesthood, the sacrifices were patterns of spiritual realities in the heavens. And somebody can say, see, Platonism right in the book of Hebrews. Throw the book of Hebrews out. But no, you see, Paul is saying there are spiritual realities in heaven concerning redemption of which God said, now pattern the temple, Moses, and all after these things I show you. And these patterns are limited to redemption, whereas idealism applies to the whole created order. See, so there's a big difference right away. But anyway, students of philosophy will recognize Platonic idealism in this Protestant theory of the church. Now, many who would deny, and many Protestants will, deny equating the kingdom with the church. Nevertheless, in actual fact, they do with this mystical body of Christ. They end up the same place. I mean, in actual fact, some teach that there's a separation between the kingdom and the church. They're not the same. We see that, they say. But they end up in the same place with their universal mystical body of Christ church theory to which everybody who's saved belongs, and everybody who's saved is in the kingdom, so you end up the same place. You've identified the two. But what we're saying, the New Testament shows you that the kingdom is the reign and rule of God in our hearts. The church is you. So the kingdom and the church are never equated in the New Testament. You have to go to Catholicism or Protestantism that came out of Catholicism to find that. That's not something that's even debatable. I mean, you can debate it. I don't mean that. But it's not even debatable if you'll stay with the Word. It's not something that I took up as a hobby or a little aside, but I've spent many years in the doctrine of the Church and the doctrine of the Kingdom. I've yet to find anybody who can prove their theory about a universal Church. It's not taught in the Bible. And even verses that you might think you have something, you know, a peg to hang some theory on. In light of all the New Testament teaching, it's clearly the local visible church is the only thing the Bible knows anything about. You've got the kingdom. What do you need with a universal, mystical, invisible body of Christ's church to belong to? You're already the church right here. You're a member of the kingdom. What do you have to be a member of three things for? Amen. Especially when you can't find that third one in the Word of God. So... Every born-again believer is a member of the kingdom. He's in the kingdom. Colossians 1 says he is. But by no means down through history has every believer or member of that kingdom been a member of a true New Testament church. To this hour, there are people who are in the kingdom and not in the true church. You see? So you couldn't equate them. Some are not true churches. And yet they belong, quote-unquote, to that local visible assembly. And they're saved. They believe in Jesus Christ, so they are in the kingdom. Colossians 1, when you believe, you're translated out of the kingdom of the world into the kingdom of God. When you're born again, he says you become a member of the kingdom of God. But nowhere does he say you've got to be in the church. You're not in anything. You are it. And if you can get two or three gathered together, you can have a church. You can't be a church one person because you're just a leg or an eye or an ear. And wouldn't you look funny if that's all you had in your body? Now, we've got to have a complete body functioning like a New Testament church. But the point is that you can be in the kingdom and not the church. Then conversely, 
there have been many and still are people who are members of local churches. I mean, they belong. That's what we mean by membership. Members of local churches who are not in the kingdom because they haven't received the message of the kingdom. They're not born again. They're members of local churches, you know, with the name on the roll, I mean. So that's the first point where we say the New Testament does not equate the two. Secondly, the kingdom of God in the Bible is a broader or a more comprehensive concept than the church. Now you can study the New Testament as well as our tapes on this, but the kingdom of God is universal, invisible, and spiritual. The kingdom of God is a broader concept than the church. The kingdom of God is universal, invisible, spiritual. Now if you study the New Testament, you'll find every time the church is local, not universal, local, tangible, not spiritual. It's made up of bodies of flesh and blood, human beings, tangible and quite visible. See, just the opposite. For example, Luke 17, 20, 21. I'll just quote it. We've already quoted it. Luke 17, 20, 21. The kingdom of God is within you. See, invisible, spiritual. Now, you could multiply all those texts that prove that. Colossians 1.13, we've already cited. When you're born again, you're translated into the kingdom of God. So we said the kingdom is universal, spiritual, and invisible. Now the church, look at Revelation 2 and verse 1. And you'll never have that said of the church, that it is universal, invisible, or spiritual. Spiritual in the sense that it's not tangible. It certainly should be spiritual, shouldn't it? In the other sense. All right, Revelation 2, 1. Unto the angel of the church of Ephesus write. And then he goes right down through the seven churches and says, write to that church. A local, visible, tangible assembly. Not to some universal invisible. Why didn't Jesus address himself to the universal, invisible, mystical body of Christ? Then see, that would easily include every believer from the beginning to the end, living and dead. But he always addresses himself like the letters, the epistles, to a church, a local church. Look at 1 Corinthians 1, 2, the epistle where the metaphor you know what a metaphor is? Where the metaphor body of Christ occurs. 1 Corinthians 1, 2. Unto the church of God which is at Corinth. Not some mystical invisible thing. Of course you'll find that in all of the passages like to the churches of Galatia. Where he didn't say to the church of Galatia if it was some universal at least Galatian-wide religious system, but he writes to the churches of Galatia, since there's a church at Corinth. The city, Galatia, is a province, so he said church is, and not singular church, but here he writes to a local church. All right, 1 Corinthians 1, 2 said, unto the church of God which is at Corinth. Chapter 12, verse 13. For by one Spirit are we all baptized into one body, whether Jews or Gentiles and so forth. All right, one Spirit, we're all in one body. Then jump down to verse 27. Now ye are the body of Christ. There's the metaphor, and his members in particular. He addressed it to the church at Corinth, and he said, you there at Corinth, that local visible assembly, you are the body of Christ. And if there was no other local church in the world but Corinth, then they would be the whole body of Christ. The body of Christ is a metaphor. Showing relationship. He's the head, we're his body on earth. And he uses all through chapter 12 the analogy of a physical body. And they take this metaphor and make a reality out of it and then get us members of that invisible, universal, mystical body of Christ somewhere. But there's not a word in the Bible that teaches it. Again, 
for fear of making repetition, but I'll say it anyway, get the tapes on the doctor and the church where we go into much detail on this. But we need it as a part of our study here to remind you of one or two things that he said to the church at Corinth, ye are the body of Christ. In other words, they are all it is. And when you go over to Galatia and find a church, he would say to them, ye are the body of Christ. You go to Ephesus, ye are the body of Christ. And if he came to North Webster, he'd say to Faith Assembly, ye are the body of Christ. There's no universal something we belong to. We're it. The church at Corinth was it. That's it. That's the one he was addressing at that time. So the word of God, if you bother to study it, puts to rest that erroneous, invisible, mystical theory of Protestantism. And as I say, it's significant that Christ addresses himself in chapters 2 and 3 of Revelation to the churches of Asia and names them local churches. It had been so easy if there had been a universal mystical church somewhere to just say, John, address my words to the church, universal, because it's not going to just be limited to those seven churches of Asia, which we know it isn't, but because there isn't any church universal. In the New Testament, the local church is not a part of a universal mystical body, but in the New Testament, the local church is the church in its local expression. Now, you ought to write it down or remember it, one or the other, and you'll save yourself a lot of confusion. In the New Testament, the local church is not a part of some universal mystical body, as the Reformers taught. But the local church is the church in its local expression. This is the church of Jesus Christ right here. Then you go over in southern Indiana or Texas or wherever, where there's a true church, then that will be the church in its local expression. And if you get all of the local bodies together, you would have the church, if you get them all under one roof, say in a big football stadium that would hold all true Christians who are members of true churches, then that would be the church of the world right there in that football stadium. They wouldn't belong to something off somewhere that they don't even know about, never heard about until way down in the Middle Ages. So the church in the New Testament is local and visible and quite tangible. Again, the church is not to be equated with the kingdom because the church is the agent commissioned to proclaim the kingdom. The church isn't the kingdom. The church has been called to proclaim the kingdom. Now, we've already shown you and we remind you again that in Jesus' commission, he commissions always to go preach the kingdom. You see this in the... 12 that he sent forth in Matthew 10 and verse 7, he said, go preach the kingdom. You see it when he sent forth the 70 in Luke 10 and verse 9, he said, go preach the kingdom. And when he himself came on the scene, we're told he preached the kingdom and said, repent and believe the gospel. See, the gospel is the message of the kingdom. And as we've shown you, when he was raised from the dead for 40 days before he ascended, that is, permanently ascended to the Father in his right hand, he spoke to them, we're told, concerning the kingdom of God. Their only thought was not, Lord, when are you going to establish your church? The apostles said, are you going to restore the kingdom now to Israel? That's all they're talking about. And all through the book of Acts, whenever you hear them preaching the gospel, it's called the message of the kingdom of God. So the church has been called to proclaim the kingdom. Thus, through the proclamation of the gospel, which is the message of the kingdom, and through the signs of the kingdom, miracles, raising the dead, casting out demons, healing the sick, speaking in new tongues, all in Mark 16. Through the preaching of the message of the kingdom and the operation of the signs of the kingdom, then the church in the New Testament is seen to be the instrument of the kingdom, not the kingdom itself. The New Testament differentiates between the church and the kingdom. Fourthly, we see the church in the New Testament is the key to the kingdom. In a sense, 
saying the same thing that we just said, but with much more detail needed in explanation because there's a lot of ideas about what the keys to the kingdom are. But the church, fourthly, is the key into the kingdom. Now let me repeat one thing. This doesn't mean it's the Roman Catholic teaches that you have to be in a particular church to be in the kingdom. Of course, in their case, it would be their church. And whether or not they would want to admit or not, Baptists are just as dogmatic about that. My friends, when I was a Baptist, we would not take your northern baptism. We were southern Baptists. We rebaptized you. You had to get right baptism, scriptural baptism, southern Baptist baptism. Don't look cross-eyed at the Catholics and be proud because, I'm oh, thank God I'm not a Catholic but a Baptist. That's my background. Listen, they're as dogmatic as the Catholics. I mean, good old... Dogmatic Baptists really don't believe, really don't believe. They have a hard time believing that a Methodist will make it. <laughs> well, that's true. Oh, we hammered away at that works and fallen from grace teaching as Baptists. And while in your heart of hearts you knew there had to be somebody besides Baptists that somehow could get in, yet you really couldn't admit it because it was like you're letting down the hedge. Like one fellow said, another brother that I prayed for to receive the baptism, another Baptist pastor, and he knew my Baptist background, he asked me to pray for him. You know, one Baptist for another. He went to a Pentecostal meeting once, and he said, oh, they shouted and raised their arms and all of these things that are so unnecessary to the baptism of the Holy Spirit. I see it's valid. I'd like to have it, but I don't go in for that. So he wanted a Baptist pray for him. The first thing he did when he got the baptism, just like a Pentecostal, <laughs> running around the bedroom with his arms in the air for about 30 minutes. So another brother who always taught that there's going to be a latter-day outpouring of the Holy Spirit until he saw that we got it, then he said, that isn't it. I don't know what he's waiting on, but anyway, at least he admitted, he said, you know, he named this fellow that was talking to him, who's also a friend of his, he says, when you and Hobart Freeman, the most dogmatic Baptist ever born, and that's true. I know I was, I don't know about the other. He said, if you've got something like the baptism of the Holy Spirit, it bears investigation. You know, something to that effect. So I know about dogmatism. But anyway, what we were saying, the church is the key into the kingdom, and it isn't just the Catholics believes their churches. The Methodists, I mean died in the wool Methodists, holiness Methodists, or Presbyterians or Lutherans. You got to join their church to make it in. I'm talking about not those who are party goers and smoke in the church lobby and all that kind of stuff, but people who are really sincere, you know, like the Orthodox Jews to this hour. They believe they're the only ones going to make it in. There's a little group over in another state here, just a handful, that wear the old uniform of a religious order. I'm sure they must think they're the only ones really going to make it. But anyway, that isn't what we're talking about, that the church as the key into the kingdom. We'll see what we mean by the keys later, but we want to get that out of the way because you see it's possible to be in the kingdom and not be in the church. That's what we said. It's possible. You don't recommend that. But see, that just knocks in a cocked hat the theories that you equate the two because the thief on the cross, Jesus said, today you'll be with me in paradise in the kingdom, and he never did get on off the cross and join a church. <laughs> never did. In fact, there wasn't any yet. See, that didn't come till Pentecost which is a considerable time later. And down through history, you'll find people. Just to this hour, you may live in an area where there's no true New Testament church, but you're a believer, you're born again. So after putting all that aside, now let's look at what it means by saying the church is the key into the kingdom. At least we'll introduce it tonight, because there's a rather lengthy subject. We want to look first at Matthew 16 verses 13 to 19 because this is where we get the basis or the terminology of keys into the kingdom on the basis of what Peter said and then what Jesus replied to him. 
When Jesus came to the coast of Caesarea Philippi, he asked the disciples, saying, Whom do men say I, the Son of Man, am? Some say that you're John the Baptist, Elijah, Jeremiah, or one of the prophets. He said unto them, But whom say ye that I am? And Simon Peter answered and said, verse 16 of Matthew 16, Thou art the Christ, the Son of the living God. And Jesus answered and said unto him, Blessed art thou, Simon Barjona, for flesh and blood has not revealed it unto thee, but my Father which is in heaven. And I say also unto thee that thou art Peter, his name means rock, and upon this rock I will build my church, and the gates of Hades shall not prevail against it. Then it's verse 19 is where we get the concept of the keys. And I will give unto thee the keys of the kingdom of heaven. And here comes binding and loosing with keys. Whatsoever thou shalt bind on earth shall be bound in heaven, and whatsoever thou shalt loose on earth shall be loosed in the heaven. Here's where it helps to have a good translation if you don't read the Greek. I don't recommend anybody's versions as something you rush out and buy, but anyway, William's translation of the New Testament is a fairly literal translation. Being non-charismatic, naturally he would miss some things, wouldn't he? Like he makes speaking in tongues ecstasy. Well, it is. Praise the Lord. <laughs> but not the way he means it. But he's literal as you can be on the Greek, and he translates this. I read it years ago, but I never shall forget it. I read it way back in college out of his version. He translates what the Greek says, Whatsoever you bind on earth shall be having been bound in heaven. In other words, it's already bound in heaven. Past tense. And whatever you loose on earth shall be having been loosed in heaven. So it's not people running around down here and binding and loosing at will things that God is not going to be bound with or loosed in heaven with or about. You can't just bind and loose everything. That's why you have to get in tune with the Lord, you see. Because what you bind has already been bound. He's not kind of waiting on you to do something. He's not waiting to see what you're going to do. And then having to say, hey, hey, i got to quit talking to you angels over here. Here's one of my sons down here ready to bind something. I want to see what it is. He already has bound it. <laughs> well, it pays to know Greek, and if you don't know Greek, get a good Greek translation, I guess. <laughs> and if you don't have either one of those, get the tapes. And we're not selling tapes. We always say get the tapes. If you are hungry enough, there are ways to get the tapes. There's a tape library, for one thing. And by the way, the keys of the kingdom. That means end of the kingdom. You know what a key is for? To open a door. He says, whatever you bind or loose has been bound and loosed. So what are the keys? Well, we're going to introduce it tonight. What's your appetite? What are the keys? Well, there are various views. So let's start with the first one, which is the Roman Catholic Church which really always stands pretty much opposed to the Protestant view on anything, so we'll start with that. The Roman Catholic Church contends that on the basis of this passage, which speaks of the rock and the keys and the binding and loosing, that Peter here is made the chief apostle by Jesus. Thou art Peter. And he says, upon this rock I'll establish my church. And so the rock is Peter, Peter is made here the first pope because he established the church at Rome. Now, friends, I don't know if you ever have or will read any church history. Can you say pure conjecture about an error? That is pure or impure, either way, conjecture. There is not a fragment, a shred of evidence in history that Peter ever went to Rome, let alone establish a church there. That is utterly pure conjecture, and they're finding his finger bones now under the altar. You know, they're always coming up with something. Oh, this is Peter. How do they know that's Peter? Peter's bones. You know, they're in the habit of burying everybody and then digging them up 50 years later and making a saint out of them and sending their 
bones, finger bones, toe bones, literally rip bones all over the world as relics. They put them in glass boxes and people go to that. It's a shrine and you get so many years out of purgatory if you make a pilgrimage. Literally that's the way they go. But anyway, their theory is that Peter here is made the chief apostle by Jesus. He founded the church at Rome that makes him the first pope. And through apostolic succession, all the popes derived their authority from Peter, symbolized in the keys that Jesus said he would give him. The key symbolizes authority. Later on, we'll show you that that is what a key does symbolize. Authority. I don't want to get ahead of myself, but anyway, you know, like the mayor of the city will give somebody the key to the city. They're saying, it's open to you. Just go unlock all the doors. They won't unlock anything, but it's just a symbol of their respect for that person. Well, anyway, so the Catholics say that the keys symbolize the authority given to Peter, who was the first pope. If you buy that, then all the popes after him have that authority. The key to bind and loose people from their sins in the confessional, which binds or looses them from the kingdom of God. If the priest does not forgive, you're out of the kingdom. If he does, you're still in the church, which is the kingdom in Catholicism. Now, really you could sum it all up under two views, but they're modifications of the next view, or additions that we'll get into. But the Protestant view, or a better term would be the non-Catholic view, because it could include this church, what it believes. So let's say the non-Catholic view, which would include Protestants, generally agree that Peter's confession of Jesus of Nazareth as the Son of God, divine Son of God, the Protestants and non-Catholics generally agree that it's Peter's confession of Jesus Christ as the Son of God, we just read it to you, which is the rock he referred to, that he would build his church upon that rock of confession. Everyone who makes a confession becomes his church. So Peter's name means rock, Petros. He's making a play on words that on the basis of your confession, then that's going to be the rock upon which I build my church. Now that is the consensus I suppose of 98 or more percent of non-Catholics. And that the keys have not, as the Catholics teach, been bestowed exclusively on Peter, but as we'll see later, on all the apostles, because they used them. Not exclusively on Peter, but all the apostles, and then of course to the church, because the church is founded on the apostles. Now that's what the Bible says. Church is built on the foundation of the apostles and Christ is the chief cornerstone, Ephesians 2. So you didn't think we became erroneous there. In other words, then the keys pass on to the church is what we're saying. And that the keys consist of the gospel, which points sinners to the doorway into the kingdom. The keys are the gospel, which opens the doorway into the kingdom. See, the church is the key to the kingdom in that view. That is supported by a statement of Jesus in Luke 11.52 that the word of God is called the key of knowledge. The word of God, and we say gospel, you're talking about the word of God, is called by Jesus the key of knowledge. That is, a correct understanding of the scriptures is the key which unlocks the way to true salvation, or the way into the kingdom. There in Luke 11.52, he's giving a scathing denunciation of the Pharisees and the Sadducees and the leaders, and then he gets down to the lawyers and the scribes. Verse 52, Woe unto you, lawyers! For you have taken away the key of knowledge. See, they taught the word of God. But they added all of this minutiae of 
tradition and so forth that Jesus constantly said they shouldn't have done. He says, you've taken away the key of knowledge. You entered not in yourselves into what? Into salvation, the kingdom. You entered in not yourselves, and them that were entering in ye hindered. With what? With their teaching. The scribes and the lawyers were the teachers. With all of their traditions that Jesus constantly rebuked. The Protestant, our non-Catholic view, it's Peter's confession, that's the rock. It would have to be because there's absolutely no evidence that the church was ever built on Peter. Even Paul himself had to rebuke him later in Galatians 2. He said, Peter, you're an error. Paul said, I rebuked him publicly. And even Peter said, Paul writes scripture. Peter said that. So when he wrote Galatians, he was writing scripture. Peter himself said that. So there's not one shred of evidence that anything was ever established on Peter. It was his confession. The keys were not given exclusively to him because, as we know from the book of Acts and all through church history, all the apostles and later the church use the keys. If you accept the fact the keys are the gospel, if not, you got a problem, I guess, but the key into the kingdom is the gospel we preach. And Jesus' words in Luke 11:52 certainly seem to support that, that he rebuked those for taking away the key into the kingdom, which was his word, knowledge of the word, which is a good place to stop because we've got quite a bit to do with the keys. Now, between now and then, ask yourself, what is a key? So when he said he gives to Peter the keys to the kingdom, then you ought to be able to figure out what a key's for. Amen. Would you stand, please, and be dismissed? Father, it's in Jesus' name which heaven respects before which the devil trembles that we proclaim the message of the kingdom to the people that you have selected to be citizens and members of the kingdom, even your church. And we recognize the solemn responsibility that we have not to give our views, men's views, but simply to state what the Holy Spirit has already said through your holy word. And so we ask that you will implant in every heart a desire to know that and to be delivered from the past, the errors, the denominational creeds, and man's views and ideas which bind instead of liberate, like the Word of God does. So our prayer is that our hearts will be in tune with thine and open to your Holy Word, which truly can set us free and give us the assurance that we as the Church are in the Kingdom. In Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Praise God. Hallelujah. Praise the Lord. Amen. God bless you. God bless you. See you Sunday.